real leadership requires that we keep our own house in order. The Committee on Climate Change warns that plans are significantly off track. And nowhere is this more the case than in transport. The purpose of today's workshop is to explore what would be a credible and politically deliverable framework for decarbonizing transport. In understanding the scale of the challenge, we need to consider the equity implications and the wider political context. What does net zero mean for global Britain? For the levelling up agenda? For a stronger economy? And how do we reconcile competing objectives? I think everybody understands that if we want to achieve net zero, then we've just got to decarbonise transport and a lot quicker than uh, business as usual will allow. According to the Climate Change Committee, when we get to zero, I'm quoting, uh, we will then no longer be contributing or causing climate change. No, not true. Of course we'll be causing climate change, uh, even if all the emissions are eliminated territorially inside the UK, as long as we trade with anyone else in the world and those imports include carbon intensive stuff. So if you want to be net zero, it needs to be net zero carbon consumption, not net zero carbon production inside the UK alone. Transport isn't just about issues like trains and cars and buses and so on. It's about the guts of almost everything that we do in our economy Almost everything has to move, and it has an international dimension. The second thing about uh, transport is that it's a USO. It's a universal service obligation. No citizen can participate in our society unless they have access to transport. And we know what transport poverty means to people in rural areas, people in deprived locations, when there aren't buses or any other form of accessible transport. There's no single answer to decarbonisation and we heard from people who are experts in understanding fuel, we heard from economists who were keen to explain the importance of giving the right sort of economic in incentives. We've had people from the supply chain, from local authorities, councillors, so it's been a really important group that have come together including academics talking about the problem also what we have to change going forward if we're going to meet this important target. Are there contradictions between policies consistent with delivering on the net zero target and delivering for those who only lent the Conservatives their vote in the last election? The nine-year freeze in fuel duty has caused an additional five million tonnes of, of greenhouse gas emissions by encouraging more trips by car and fewer trips by public transport. However, the freeze has been a benefit to many on low incomes who are dependent on their cars. At the same time, in undermining public transport networks, the, fuel, the freeze in fuel duty has been damaging for some of the very poorest in our society. These aren't easy choices politically. We have to worry much more about prices and taxation if we're going to succeed in moving sensibly at low compliance costs. To the war, towards the zero carbon. This is what's happened to the rate of fuel duty. And actually, the decline goes back to the year 2000, uh, where the peak is. But at constant prices, if fuel duty is 58 pence a litre today, it was uh, over 80 pence a litre at its peak. My point is that uh, that creates a substantial headroom to restore some of that decline and help us with the problems uh, which are the headline of this conference. The receipts from fuel duty are shown here. The red is uh, fuel duty and the green is vehicle excise duty. But you'll see, as you'd expect, that the receipts have declined at, at constant prices. If it was 45 billion at the turn of the century, it's now 34 billion, partly because of the decline in rates, but also partly, of course, because of the increasing uh, efficiency, improving efficiency of vehicles. In the meantime, traffic has grown, but the revenue has gone down. 
The obvious answer for this, and I believe um, it will come, is road user charging. People know me know I've been arguing for this for the last 30 years completely unsuccessfully. Um, <laughs> it will have to come. You only have to look at the, the problem I've just outlined from the Treasury's point of view. There, are, there have to be some form of distance-based charging, but the consensus seems to be we can't do that yet. So I think we have to think about what we should do in the interim, and fuel duty suggests itself as a second best, but a, a useful interim measure, and it has an, all these classic advantages. Here are some back of the envelope calculations, just to show what you might do, an average yield per year over that period of four billion a year. Nearly enough to pay for HS2, but not quite. <laughs> So how do you use those revenues sensibly to mitigate the <coughs> public opposition? My argument is you might make this more acceptable if all or most of the incremental revenue is going to be ring-fenced and made available to local authorities in some form for beneficial transport purposes. And a way to do that will be to reinvent something we're actually very good at historically in this country, some notion of public trust. So what about a stronger economy? A compact, mass transit orientated model for urban development is the best chance that we have of, for, of decoupling economic growth from carbon emissions. We've devised a whole uh, framework for analysing public investments, the Green Book and so on, and for how regulators behave on the basis of cost benefit analysis which looks at each project in its own right and in its own merits. So that matters, of course, that's important. But what really is going to drive decarbonisation is having a low carbon road, rail, air integrated system. People understand about electrification and they understand about smart systems. But what they don't really take into account as well is just how far digitalisation will drive the entire economy and therefore the choices that we have to make about whether we actually want transport, what form of transport we require and how we require to get from A to B. And when we look at regulation, it's precisely designed not to address the integration of transport into our digital world and into our economy in a decarbonisation context. The questions have changed and now we need different institutions to answer that. The fibre networks are the premier and primary infrastructures of the future upon which everything else is going to depend. I firmly believe in something I refer to as the triple access system. Uh, travel is a derived demand, as we all know. Um, it's being able to reach people, goods, services and opportunities. Uh, and we can do that with good land use planning and through use of a very mature telecommunication system. Uh, now, the challenge is we've got the silos of government nationally and locally to overcome in order to do that. How quickly can new infrastructure be commissioned and rolled out? How quickly can vehicle fleets turn over? How quickly can the makeup of travel demand be changed? Carbon intensive modes should be used less. More walkable journeys should be walked. Existing zero carbon modes such as cycling cycles and e-bikes should take a greater share of trip making. And as Dieter mentioned, digital connectivity has grown massively as a lower carbon alternative to travel in terms of gaining access remotely to people, goods, services and opportunities. A long-standing proposition, as you'll know, has been the notion that the external <coughs> costs of transport should be internalised. In the face of the decarbonisation challenge, this now seems more compelling than ever. Urgent consideration should be given to how today's digitally connected society and the technological means we have could support personalised mobility pricing. Does politically deliverable, in Claire's exam question, mean being able to move the goalposts if necessary? In my book, Greta Thunberg is an outstanding communicator. Amazing that she's only 17. She does her homework and she sets out clear, digestible messages. By explaining the need for change from business as usual, she's been an amplifier of public concern, but also public appetite to play a part in the change that's needed. But her message remains heard by the few rather than many. 
there's a need to vote to devote greater attention and resource to an ongoing program of widespread communication and education that helps bring and keep the public and businesses on side with the change that's required. There are essentially two broad ways to reduce emissions from the transport sector. The first is to, to get rid of the fossil fuels out of the system. The second way is to use those vehicles that use fossil fuels less. And the more you do of one, the less you have to do the other. Very simple, I know, to put it that way. Um, but it is actually, I think, a very helpful, practical systems perspective. Dieter Helm talked about systems uh, perspective, and I will too. And it's actually also quite a useful way of thinking about essentially what the political trade-off is. Because approach A is very much more politically acceptable than approach B. When you explain the trade-off in the way that I just have, and you say effectively that we are between a rock and a hard, a hard place, there is nothing other than hard decisions. It's just that some of the decisions and the solutions are less hard than others. It is incredibly helpful you see pennies drop. So that's a little bit about sort of public and political acceptability. But what about credibility, which is the other part of the exam question? We only have nine years left of the current budget that we use on an annual basis now. Or, to put it another way, the Climate Change Committee, if you use their budgets, it translates into a 4% reduction of carbon emissions year on year. If you take some of the more stringent calculations and portion that down to the transport sector, it amounts to a 14% reduction in carbon emissions each year. And that is precisely why technical solutions will fail us. We, if we take those trajectories, even if we go halfway between the 4 and the 14%, then we would have to stop selling petrol and diesel tomorrow because of how long they stay around in the fleet. Tomorrow, we have to completely rip up the current appraisal system. Journey time is no longer relevant on a planet that is screaming for help. Total packages of policies must be appraised. Again, we heard this from detail. So, not single schemes. We have to appraise the whole of the RIS2, the roadwork building programme, at the same time. All together. We've got to have a total reformulation of transport pricing. Please, can we rip up the words road pricing and congestion charging? They are toxic. They are politically undeliverable. We can use other words which are much truer to our objectives and our values around eco-charging and eco-levy. And the public is ready for that with, when we have a conversation about the trade offs I think fora where you can mix up modes in transport are always good. For we can mix up typologies of, of people, so you've got academics with people from LEPs, people from charities, people from businesses, that those are all valuable things to bring together. It doesn't happen so much, actually, um, so there's always a value in that. Um, and the challenge again is how to crystallize that and get some, some agreed common action points. I want to stick to the theme of local authorities here. Um, Let's assume in a scenario two, three years from now that they've got the resources in terms of money to do things, especially in transport. What would you rather they be prioritizing as of, let's say, the next five years? If it isn't EV charging, if it isn't just focused on, say, buses or cycles or what, ha what have you, what should they prioritize? It isn't one thing, because as I said, you have to have carrots and sticks. If you want to develop livable cities, you have to reduce car use, and that will reduce the number of cars that can be accommodated on the whole system. And there is no, no way you can argue against having a smaller fleet that is used more efficiently. Everyone has a right to live without a car. We have to have a discussion about what is meat for the national interest and what is meat for local uh, authority. I, for me, carbon reduction has to be a national thing. So if you're getting really serious about carbon reduction, I think there has to be a very aggressive national policy, which is why I'm talking about national taxation as part of it.
Yeah. So the question of what would I say local, local authorities do, it's for them to decide, not what I, providing they're acting with a, within a framework which is consistent with the big national picture. I guess the optimist in me says that um, necessity is the mother of invention um, and that we, we may have a, uh, an imperative now that transcends party political lines. Um, so I have optimism in that sense, but uh, on the other hand, I can see a half empty glass in front of me because I, I was talking to Steve earlier today. I remember a historic moment, I thought, um, in the Labour administration years where all three parties agreed that we needed national road pricing. And I thought, wow, this is incredible. I'm here. And then within five minutes, they descended into huge disagreement because they didn't mean the same thing. I was just to ruminate about uh, whether, whether there have been big social changes over the years which have, as it were, gone across different political administrations. Of course, they have. Uh, but it's, it, it's born of a, a genuine change of, of public attitudes, a real understanding of what what the truth of the matter is, what can and can't be done. I do have concerns that even though we sense we might be on a, a collective journey uh, of urgency, that when we get into the detail, we'll get caught up in the inertia of party politics, debating what type of catenary technology or what type of restrictions on vehicle classes and so on um, that are needed. Um, so it's not easy. What I think we have to hope um, is that we're also now in a in an international environment which perhaps provides that continuity, um, we hope. But goodness knows now with geopolitics, um, you know, the only word that's certain is uncertainty. Finally, the fact that we're living in a global economy is being laid bare right now by the market turmoil we're witnessing in reaction to the coronavirus. If this triggers a worldwide recession, will we lose focus on tackling climate change? We can be sure that if the economy tanks, climate change will be downgraded, just like it was a decade ago with the last world economic recession. The flagship policy, of course, is to grow the city in a way that is sustainable and have 80% of Londoners' trips to be by walking, cycling or public transport uh, during the period of the strategy. Even without significant decarbonisation of public transport, it still is self-evidently a much more efficient way in carbon terms as well as in movement terms of getting people to move around the city. We already operate today the largest zero emission bus fleet in Europe. Uh, we will, under our current plans, uh, be at 2,000 vehicles in just over four years' time. Finally, on to um, the role of regulation and charging. I do think it plays a very important role. Uh, and I think the example you perhaps can uh, take something from is air quality uh, in London. So uh, this mayor, uh, Steve Khan, made it a big thing uh, for this mayoralty to raise the issue of the air quality crisis that exists uh, in London. The results so far have been really quite impressive, I think, in central London, a 30% reduction uh, in NOx, uh, and actually a reduction in traffic overall, uh, and this is there a 4% reduction in CO2 emissions, although that's not the focus uh, particularly of this policy. But I think if we are to move forward uh, on local issues like air quality, that's easier for people sometimes to identify with about the air quality outside their school or so on, than it is with a global climate emergency. So we have the opportunity to link the two and to move the policies forward so that we're able to deliver both together. Let's just talk about how we are decarbonising road transport. Well, I guess the first question is, are we? And um, based on the last 27 years, not really. Um, DFT stats, uh, we've gone from 128 uh, megatons of CO2 from domestic transport down to 126 in 27 years. So <clears throat> the problem is a huge one. And we haven't made a big dent over the last uh, 27 years on that. Arguably, the worst thing we can do is buy an electric vehicle and then not use it because you've got this great big lump of carbon that you've uh, emitted in, in, in buying that. What we want to do is to use those really efficient, really low carbon vehicles intensively. We've got to, we've got to motivate the costs and sustainable transport and mass transit. Uh, what we can't do is continue to make that more and more costly than motoring. Uh, as you can probably see from this, the green line, which is the motoring costs, has been almost static for about uh, eight, nine years now. Uh, and that, 
doesn't lead us to a sustainable transport system, which in, in, in essence has to be a highly intensive and efficient transport system with uh, mass transit solutions. So I think roads are both part of the problem and also part of the solution. Uh, the road is not the issue itself, it is what is using it. At the moment we have a higher propensity for uh, car use and in the future we recognise that we've got to reduce that car use but also we've got to decarbonise the fleet that is running on that. And my subject area is, is fuels and, and it's very clear that fuels are far from the only means of helping transport decarbonise but it's really important as Andy said they are actually delivering 78% of the carbon um, savings being achieved today and they could do so much more. I don't think uh, a, a battery electric 44 tonne truck makes much sense um, and so there's got to be other forms of fuel going into those. Then they wouldn't be allowing them on the road to the start, the payload plus the battery in the tractor would just mean that that's not actually an equal proposition. So. Next week the uh, London Cycling Campaign will be launching a new report and a new campaign in the run up to the mayor elections in May, calling on all of the candidates in the election to commit themselves to an agenda of decarbonising London's roads over the next 10 years by 2030 to get to a situation where it essentially becomes unnecessary for most people in London most of the time to own a private motor vehicle. We need to see smart, dynamic road user charging in place in London by 2024 in operation so that we can both manage demand and provide the finance that Gareth will need to invest in buses and in cycling infrastructure in the future. The bus industry uh, has committed to delivering um, multi-operator price cap tickets in, in cities across the country, in the north but elsewhere, by 2023. We'll have the first such scheme up and running by the end of this year. Individual operators have lifetime uh, information about the buses on their apps. If you're a regular commuter and you know who you're travelling with, that's great, you can use it. Not everybody's a regular commuter, and sometimes you'll want to see information from multiple bus operators and your train operator at the same time. Open data, wrong in, wrong out in the course of this year gives us a great opportunity to do just that. I think it'll be a really important element in improving the passenger experience still further. I think it covers a lot of ground, taxation, modal shift, all sorts of ingredients towards our key topic, which was decarbonisation and how to get there quickly. Uh, I think there's a wealth of expertise in the room, uh, loads of super ideas. You've told us about your directions of travel, but please tell us more with some reassurance that you've got the speed on your side as well. How can the rail industry decarbonise without more electrification? So everything is based through web tag, and the whole system that we have in place is designed around my officers making those choices, not about actually decarbonising the spaces and the road infrastructure around it. And that is what's centrally wrong about our system moving forward and how do we challenge that. I can't help but feel the magnitude of what you can achieve within the current levels of taxpayer support that's available typically is completely inadequate. So my question is, if you're going to address the problem we started with today, how much taxpayer support do you need and where is it going to come from? There definitely needs to be more money put into transport. If you look at the power sector and how much government subsidy has gone in there, it's about eight billion a year, uh, compared to about one billion for, for funding of OLEF with the grants and the EV infrastructure to date. So that's a massive uh, difference. But I think also there's the policy framework needs to have more cohesion. You can't, but on the one hand, be giving out EV grants and on the other hand, having a VED system that really encourages the uptake of SUVs, it just doesn't make sense. Isn't it remarkable that when we need to find 20 billion to fund trident, we can buy it. <laughs> when we want to find 15 billion to support the banks in one week, we can find it. And yet here we are talking about it as if it's the BFP's budget. This is much more important than that, much more scalable. And that's where the money's got to come. The most interesting thing about today is what it tried to set out to do, which was to really get people talking about how to decarbonise transport at scale and rapidly. We're very keen to have more debates around the regions because this was clearly focused in, uh, in London and I think that issues, different issues come out um, as we move around the country. 
The challenges we face in decarbonising transport here in the UK are replicated the world over. Global Britain means that we need to lead by example in doing everything we can to reduce emissions from our most polluting sector.